Hi everyone, welcome to mini lesson eight. This is where we start chapter seven. That's the last chapter we're gonna do in spring 2020. Um, it's a chapter where we talk about true quantum statistical mechanics. It's kind of interesting to think about um, what do we mean by quantum in quantum statistical mechanics. It does not mean just using quantized energy levels like we've been doing already in chapter six. What it means is <clears throat> incorporating specifically Pauli exclusion or no Pauli exclusion and how you count how many particles are allowed to be in a given level. So in order to do that properly, we need to develop new tools. And we're going to start that with this lecture here today. The tools are, <clears throat> the, sorry, I got a, a little bit of a sore throat. The tools are the grand canonical ensemble from which we derive the grand partition function and the Gibbs factor. This is coming from 7.1 of Schroeder. So let's go back and talk about how we got the Boltzmann probability within the canonical ensemble. Right, so we developed the idea that if we imagine a large reservoir at temperature T in thermal equilibrium with a very small subsystem, and we can uh, think about the expanding the entropy um, of the reservoir about the total energy of the system and then that allows you to calculate directly the probability that the subsystem has this small fraction e sub s and so that's the Boltzmann factor divided by the partition function where the partition function is the sum of all the possible Boltzmann factors accessible to the subsystem and so you can compute averages using that probability and in fact we found that you can do all of thermodynamics just from knowing the canonical partition function but we need to modify this if we want to keep careful track of particle numbers for Pauli exclusion purposes, right? And so to do that, we need to modify our concept of the reservoir to have not just a temperature, <coughs> excuse me, but also a chemical potential, right? And so the temperature of the reservoir determines its propensity for exchanging energy with a subsystem. <coughs> And the chemical potential determines a reservoir's propensity for exchanging particles, right? So now we need to characterize our reservoir by how much energy it has, by how many particles it has, and the same goes for the subsystem, particles and energy. So again, if we want to insist upon a Pauli exclusion principle for an energy level E sub s, we need to have tight control over the value of n sub s, and that's the goal of building this new tool. So here it is again. I'm following through the exact same steps of the derivation that I did for the canonical ensemble. It's no different. So what we're going to do is write the total energy of the system as the sum of the reservoir and the subsystem, where the subsystem energy is very small, and the same for the number of particles the number of particles in the subsystem is always going to be much less than the total number of particles in the combined reservoir and subsystem. So keep in mind E sub s is a generic label for any of the accessible levels in the subsystem and then we're going to say that each level E sub s has a corresponding N sub s. And so our goal is to determine the probability that we have a level E sub s with particle occupation n sub s, how does it depend on those parameters and on the macroscopic parameters of the reservoir temperature and chemical potential? <clears throat> so as before, we focus on the reservoir and we note that the probability that we're interested in, the probability of e sub s and n sub s, is equal to the probability that the reservoir has a corresponding u sub r and n sub r, right, where they're just connected by the sums up here. And then we apply the Boltzmann definition of entropy to write out the multiplicity of the reservoir. So it's just multiplicity of the reservoir is e to the entropy of the reservoir over kb. So then the probability that the reservoir has those macroscopic uh, energy and particle number values is proportional to the multiplicity and so this proportionality carries through. <clears throat> 
Next step, we substitute for u sub r and n sub r these total energy minus e sub s and total particle number minus n sub s. And the fact that the e sub s and the n sub s are very small says that we can do a good job by just Taylor expanding this function sr about u and n to linear order. So, oops, messed up again. So <clears throat> u, sub s, u minus e sub s, n minus n sub s, each of these sort of have an individual Taylor expansion that appears. So the approximate value of that function is the entropy if all the energy and all the particles were in the reservoir, <clears throat> and then a correction for, well, what if you let the subsystem have a little bit of the energy and let the subsystem have a little bit of the particles? So just a multivariable Taylor expansion to linear order. So we write that again up here for reference. And we note that we have these two partials that we know about. The one multiplying energy is just 1 over t, as it was before. Nothing has changed. But now the one multiplying particle number is negative partial s, partial n at constant. n and v, no, it's not n and v, right? This is wrong. That's a, that's a copy-paste typo. So it has to be u and v. Make sure you make that change in your notes, because I'm not making it here. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, here we just write out the expansion in terms of <coughs> microscopic parameter E sub s and N sub s and macroscopic parameters temperature and chemical potential. And so now we substitute that into the probability and we get this expression that has all of that expression appearing inside the exponential. And so the probability that we're interested in is proportional to e to the minus beta times quantity e sub s minus mu n sub s. <clears throat> so I just factor a beta out of both of these terms. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so by the way, this should be easy to remember. Keep in mind that chemical potential has units of energy. And so within this uh, nested parentheses, right, an energy unit minus an energy unit is a legitimate subtraction to do. Okay, so now, just as before, we can get the normalization of that probability by just demanding that the, all the probabilities be normalized. So if we sum over <coughs> all the possible states, uh, this normalization factor times e to the minus beta epsilon s minus mu n sub s, it has to be one. So we do the same thing we did before. We solve for c. <clears throat> we call the denominator a partition function. So this is the grand canonical partition function. I like to call it beautiful z because it's most often denoted as a z with a very fancy script. It's kind of beautiful. Uh, and so it's a sum on s of all these things that look like Boltzmann factors. They're not Boltzmann factors, right? Because Boltzmann is just energy. Now we have particle number inside the sum. And so you have to let the s run in, in both of these pieces. So the full probability in the grand canonical ensemble is that exponential uh, divided by the grand canonical partition function, or beautiful z. This exponential in the top part we call the Gibbs factor as opposed to the Boltzmann factor. So Boltzmann factor is e to the minus beta energy. <coughs> Gibbs factor is e to the minus beta energy minus chemical potential times particle number. And so our main value of having this is that now within the probability, we have control over n sub s, right? We can sort of build models that allow us to explicitly say n sub s has to behave in this certain explicit way. <clears throat> pal exclusion, no pal exclusion, whatever you need. It was not true with Boltzmann probability, right? We could still get thermodynamic stuff related to n and chemical potential from the free energies we got. Uh, from the Boltzmann probability, but we sort of didn't have enough control to demand that quantum statistics was treated correctly. <clears throat> we just got what we got. <coughs> oh, sorry. <clears throat> All right, so again, starting after this mini lesson, we're going to do full on quantum statistics, but there are cases where the grand canonical ensemble. Uh, is relevant in the classical world. And the specific case that is the most revealing to me anyway is adsorption.
So adsorption is a process where you take some species like a molecule or an atom uh, and you stick it to the surface of some template, right? And so it's not absorption, it's adsorption. Adsorption is on the surface. Absorption is like a sponge where you would imagine taking some species and having it permeate throughout. So be careful not to mix those up. People like me get annoyed with that because I'm sort of a surface scientist and surface scientists study adsorption and absorption is irrelevant to us. You could also think of chemical reactions as being a case where you would want to think very hard about controlling ends inside your probabilities and I would argue that adsorption is essentially a type of chemical reaction. <clears throat> so I guess it's obligatory at this point in history to do an example related to the coronavirus. So let's go ahead and apply adsorption analysis in the Grand Canonical Ensemble to thinking about what you might want to do in combating uh, by pharmaceutical means the coronavirus. <clears throat> so if you've got a coronavirus you have basically a bunch of genetic material with a shell around it and the shell in a coronavirus has these things called spike glycoproteins <clears throat> and they're the things that actually allow the virus to enter uh, human cells and start to do damage. So if you can prevent these spike glycoproteins from doing their job, you can make the virus not relevant anymore. <clears throat> Kill it, basically. And so these little Y structures, let's call these antibodies, and these are molecules maybe that we made in a lab that can cap the spike glycoproteins and prevent them from doing their cutting job. So let's now imagine how we would set up this model as an adsorption problem, right? So the idea is that the antibodies are adsorbing to the spike glycoprotein sites. <clears throat> so N sub S is the number of antibodies at each site, right? And total is the number of sites available on the viral surface. And then let's say if we bind an antibody, we have an energy E sub S equals, sorry, epsilon sub S equals epsilon. And so that's the energy you would get if the number of antibodies at the site is exactly equal to one. The reference energy E sub S equals zero is the energy you would get if there were no antibody on the site. So N sub S equals zero. <clears throat> and so with this information, we can actually just directly do the sum to get the grand canonical partition function. So beautiful Z is equal to sum on all the possible states of the system of these Gibbs factors. And so the possible states of the system are actually listed right here in this list. The states are you can have nothing bound at the spike site and therefore no binding energy, or you can have one antibody bound at the spike site and therefore you have exactly the binding energy. Um, you know, I guess it's possible to imagine a situation where you could have multiple antibodies at a site uh, but let's just say that's not relevant here. It's very often the case that there's only one binding, <coughs> uh, only one thing can be bound per site because there's just not enough physical room in most cases for there to be more than one thing per site. So no other possible pairs of N sub S and E sub S exist in this physics problem or this <coughs> public health emergency. All right, so the zero, zero term gives us a one from the Gibbs factor, it's e to the zero. And then the one epsilon term gives us e to the minus beta times quantity epsilon minus mu. So let's keep going with this. If we have the, if we have the grand partition function, it means we actually have the full grand canonical probability so that we can use that to now calculate averages. So n bar is the average number of antibodies per site, which we calculate as sum on s of n sub s times the probability. So the probability are, uh, is the Gibbs factor divided by beautiful z. And beautiful z you can just factor out, right? Beautiful z doesn't depend on s. It's already summed over s, and so it goes straight out of the, straight out of the sum as basically a number. And so again, we've only got two pairs of epsilon and n to worry about, the first one gives us a zero, and the next one gives us an e to the minus beta epsilon minus mu over the grand partition function. 
And so I want to write that by turning this um, e to the minus thing into a product of exponentials. So that's the same as e to the beta u, mu e to the minus beta epsilon, and I do the same thing down here. And the reason for doing that is because people like to define this quantity lambda equals e to the beta mu as the fugacity or the activity. It's kind of like a generalized concentration. Um, and it's a macroscopic property that characterizes both the temperature and the chemical potential of the reservoir. <clears throat> um, so the chemical potential is often going to be negative. Um, so just think about an ideal gas. Chemical potential is always negative. It doesn't always have to be, but frequently for dilute gases and solutions uh, it will be. And so this quantity will sort of be between zero, one, zero and one and often, and so it's roughly speaking a generalized concentration. <coughs> and so we do a little bit of rearranging of n bar and we get n bar is equal to one over the inverse fugacity times e to the positive beta epsilon plus one. And again, this is the average occupation of a single site. So if we consider that we have n total sites on the virus, you could say that the number of occupied sites on the virus is n total times the average value of a single site, right? And so in other words, n bar is actually the fraction of sites on the virus that is covered. The logic is similar to this analysis that let us say that for the canonical ensemble, the total energy is just n times u bar, where, where in that case, n is the number of um, uh, constituents in the, in the system. <coughs> Whew. So what do we do with this? We can make these things called Langmuir adsorption isotherms. So if you go back, this equation is, let's call it the Langmuir adsorption formula. And if you plot any of those curves at fixed values of temperature, it's called an isotherm. And so these are a bunch of different isotherms. So coverage on the y-axis is n bar. And fugacity, or lambda, is on the uh, x-axis. And what I've done here is to plot a bunch of different Langmuir adsorption isotherms for different binding energies of the antibody to the virus. Again, at room temperature, KVT equals 26 millivolts. And so the basic thing that you can see is that the coverage of the antibody on the surface of the virus depends pretty strongly on the binding energy. And by that I mean, if you have a really weak binding antibody, it takes a huge concentration inside the reservoir to even get a little bit of coverage, right? So here we're roughly at 40% surface coverage, which might not be enough to prevent the virus from getting inside the cell, even at a very high effective concentration where the fugacity is actually approaching <coughs> its max value of one. But that as you increase the binding energy to be comparable to <coughs> or significantly bigger than the thermal energy, you start to approach very high surface coverage, even at very small values of fugacity. So here at the top, I've got a binding energy that's about five, uh, four times the thermal energy, right? And so we start at zero effective concentration, say of antibodies in the bloodstream, and then just a teeny tiny concentration in the bloodstream, 0.2, gives you more than 80% surface coverage of the virus. Um, <clears throat> And so this is something that as a biochemist or a pharmaceutical person, you might be thinking about how do I design high binding energies of antibodies on these spikes. All right, so next time we're going to move on to full quantum mechanics. We're going to remind ourselves what are bosons and fermions so that we can do grand partition functions for bosons and fermions. So we'll see you in the next mini lesson.